Recording live from the Hoban Law Group here in Denver, Colorado, I'm your host, Eric Singular. We're sitting alongside president and founder of the Hoban Law Group, Bob Hoban. Today we are talking about COVID, cybersecurity, and cannabis, how it all intersects. And we are joined by the host of the Cannabis Economy Podcast, Mr. Seth Adler. Seth, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Seth, how are you doing? Where are you located? And uh, you know, how are you holding up in these coronavirus times? Yeah, thankfully, you know, safe and sound. Uh, family's all safe and sound. Just being smart and, you know, trying to avoid, I guess, people. Um, so, you know, I hope everybody there is uh, safe and sound. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Seth, we, we are well uh, out here in Colorado and uh, – we, uh, you know, we've we've discussed and uh, appreciated what's going on around us. And, and to your point, everybody's uh, happy and healthy and, and staying at home. And, you know, it, it begs the question of uh, when will things uh, resume some semblance of normality, which uh, I don't think we can we can put a specific date on. But uh, what are your thoughts in that regard? Well, I'm uh, one of those people that thinks we are in a new normal and there is no resumption uh i think that these are the first days of the next and whatever we had before is yesterday well well and that brings us to an interesting point because if this is the new normal you know what we have seen gosh we've seen saturday night live we've seen everything go digital Everybody's on Zoom conferences. Everybody, I mean, I, I imagine the bandwidth that everybody's using is uh, a much greater than it was previously. Maybe not. But that brings us to this issue of cybersecurity, which, which I know you have some, some interesting thoughts on and would, and would love to hear them here. Yeah, well, I, I edit a, a website called the uh, Cybersecurity Hub. So absolutely, you know, I just work in, in artificial intelligence as well. Um, when I'm not thinking and talking about cannabis. And really, this is a field day opportunity uh, with all sorts of new technology, all sorts of new systems uh, being used for, you know, real work. Um, so this is, uh, this is a rough time if you're a, a CISO, right, a Chief Information Security Officer, um, because there's so much that, being used that you don't want being used. Um, you know, that, that, that's at least my humble take on that. Well, you know, Seth, it, it wasn't that long ago that I recall walking down a hallway in the Hilton Hotel off of Millennium Park in Chicago to meet some guy named Seth and to do a, a podcast. And that was, I was, I was talking to Eric, that was, that was the first podcast that, that I had ever done. And, and uh, I walk into this room and uh, there's this handsome guy sitting there uh, with, with with speakers on and or headphones on. And, and uh, I remember then very well, uh, what do you think about the industry and how far it, you, how far we've come as an industry and just how you've been able to document it uh, against the backdrop of, of where we are today with publicly traded companies, coronavirus affecting the industry, marijuana as an essential product, hemp, uh, you know, acreage off the charts. You know, what 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 is your perspective upon reflection of where we've come? I There is so much to say. You know, there's so much to unpack there. I'll try to do it justice. Number one, I also remember that day. That's the first time I saw the Bob Hoban smile. And if you, the listener, have never seen it for yourself in real life, that's the thing to look forward to post-quarantine is the Bob Hoban smile in person. Anyway, um, and I'm, I'm only uh, partly kidding there. But uh, when you and I sat down, what would that have been? Was that like 2015, 2016, something like that? 2015, so I believe, yes. Yeah, so that's real early days. That's when, you know, you had to have, uh, you know, a, a heavy set of cojones uh, to be in the cannabis industry like you were uh, at the time, right? Because I'm only an anthropologist. I'm only kind of seeing what, what's out there. Um, but, you know, it was very early days. 
and uh, you know we didn't have uh, the uh, the state banking act passed in the house and not in the senate like we do now that the, these halcyon days with uh, federal legislation on the books but but in all seriousness there were raids still going on in in California and it was just it was very very early. Um, Flash forward to you mentioned, you know, these big, um, you know, public companies, all of us then, uh, you know, thought that public companies were very far away. And we definitely figured, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bob, that the first public companies were not going to be agriculture companies. They weren't going to be plant touching companies. It was going to be, you know, all the ancillary companies were going to be the, the first ones that were the, the truly big you know, uh, public, publicly traded companies. Did, did you think differently or, or was that just me and a bunch of other people? No, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm surprised that that is how it turned out because the bet was the yeah. complete opposite. But going back to this yeah. theme of sort of what's happened over time is that you just pushed and you pushed and you pushed and you, you found this exception and you, you nudged this along. And then all of a sudden this distinction of plant touching versus ancillary became less and less prevalent. Now it's still a cornerstone for how investors make their decisions and certainly how different, different uh, folks look at the industry from different lenses. But it is remarkable that we're sitting here and there and those same companies you mentioned on the public exchanges in Canada are public, you know, cross listed here in the United States. It's it's sure. remarkable, man. It's remarkable. But it is. And then what what what's even more is that while we're federally illegal and I know 03 percent and below, uh, thank you. Thank Bob Hoban and everybody else that uh, hemp is uh, is legal across the land. Not that we have rules for that, but uh, it's at least, you know, we've got some legislation. Um, we went from being federally illegal and still are to essential. Uh, overnight here in, you know, uh, in this time of coronavirus. And that's not surprising to me as somebody that understands the plant. Um, it, it, that probably is the most surprising thing that, that has happened yet. I wonder if you, uh, if you agree or disagree. Well, what the, 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 the exped, how, how expedited this has become uh, accepted and what we were just talking about was this concept of all of a sudden you've got this economic opportunity, this fact that the plant has been deemed essential, at least in certain respects commercially, uh, and then you've got hemp farmers about to drop down seeds all over North America. Uh, there is tremendous, yeah. tremendous opportunity for this industry to really take a step forward and say, hey, uh, it, it sounds hokey, but we were here when you needed us, and we've always been here when you needed us. And oh, by the way, my cousin over here is going to make, you know, produce seeds and protein and all these other great things that are going to fuel. I, I just, I see this as, a, as a, a remarkable time for this industry to assert itself in a very positive way. It doesn't mean it's all rosy. But it is a, a, an opportunity because, you know, if you look at history, and I'm not sold on this, but if you look at history as we came out of the Great Depression, you know, and the end of alcohol prohibition seen as an economic driver. Uh, if you look at how cannabis has been impacted by public health events, if you look at the AIDS epidemic and, uh, and how that sort of prompted uh, the uh, regulation and legalization of medical forms of marijuana, particularly in California. So... It came out of a public health scenario. So I think this plan is up for the challenge. It's just, can we get over the hump? Can we um, get out of our own way sometimes? Well, I think that can we get out of our own way is a huge uh, question. But uh, I do think post-quarantine, uh, what we might see, uh, at least from some people, is kind of a return to local, a return to the earth, and a return to health and wellness. And those are all cannabis subjects right there. You know, so I do agree that this is, this is a moment in particular that, that's real good for cannabis because it takes a lot of boxes of where things, you know, might be going. Yeah, sure, we're all digital. You know, that's kind of during the day. But um, when you look at, uh, you know, however you're buying groceries, it's not the bagged bread that hard to find it's the flour people are making bread uh for the first time in a long time 
you know, as opposed to buying drugs. People are caring about what's going into their bodies. And again, that ticked all the boxes towards cannabis. I have a, a thought that was spurred by, by talking about federal legalization just for a moment. And, and Seth, I think uh, who better to address something like this than an anthropologist? But, you know, is there an... Unlike an- <laughs> is there He an- plays one on the radio. <laughs> is there an yes. advantage to, uh, you know, cannabis not being legalized at the federal level and kind of using states as experiments for success, if you will. And when you look at Canada, when you look at the way that they, that they legalized cannabis and didn't really make that, that hard distinction between marijuana and hemp, psychoactive and non-psychoactive, um, you know, are there, are there some advantages? You know, is it, is it good that we have developed this market in Colorado and then other states have followed suit, face some challenges for sure, and we've, we've seen some patterns emerge relating to those challenges, but does it mean that when federal legalization comes, we will be we will be more informed, we can take the learnings and knowledge that we've seen at the state level? Now, I'm going to pair it with one other thing, which is that, you know, to your point, we have legal hemp, but, you know, you yeah. didn't really see USDA uh, lean really hard on Colorado. Maybe they did, and, and it just didn't come through in the IFR. But you, you didn't necessarily see the reliance on that state knowledge that had been gained through hemp production. So that's a, there's a lot there, but, but I'll let you run with it. Yeah, no, I mean, what I think you're saying is the laboratories of democracy, these great states of the United States of America, are doing their job as far as kind of um, showing us what we can do and how we can do it. I, I think, you know, Bob and I have talked about this in the past. But we don't, you know, I don't know why we seem to want to reinvent the wheel every time. (laughs) We did a pretty good job in Colorado to begin with, and then we kind of started to try to reinvent the wheel. Some of that stuff, of course, has been good with the social justice and, you know, making sure that uh, communities that have been disproportionately affected by the war on drugs are served better moving forward with legal cannabis. So, sure, yeah, we've made some improvements. Um, But, uh, I mean, it's been a little messy here along the way. But I think it, yeah, I think it would have been even messier if we went from you know, top down. But I don't know if there's an example of going top down. Bob, is there? I mean, that's what's lean on you being uh, uh, a lawyer here. Uh, is there precedent for, for that type of thing, or is this usually how we do it? Well, I, I think that uh, this is usually how we do it. I, I don't think we like to go out and tackle something head on from a policy change perspective. It's just not American. Uh, we'd rather uh, yeah. we'd rather uh, uh, do something uh, that has an indirect effect, which is our primary effect, uh, our primary objective. Uh, I think that's American politics, <laughs> and that's what's uh, yeah. impacted the development of the policy in this industry for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it's, it's positive times, but I, I, Bob, I'll go back to what you said. If we can get out of our own way. And so, you know, this is where I ask you, if you don't mind, I know it's your show, but it, may I ask you the question of uh, what can you say, what can we say uh, to your colleagues about, all right, listen, we got, you know, almost a new starting line here. Let's stop doing X and start doing more of Y. You know, what, what would you say there? No, that's a great question. And, and it's, it's more of it's just what we've always been saying is just it's about professionalization and embracing change and understanding that, to your point a moment ago, that there is a, a pattern for this. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We need to voluntarily adopt existing regulations and standards across the board for consumer health and safety protection, so forth and so on when you're making products and that this industry does not need to go out, you know, and say, tax the heck out of us uh, to allow us to be in existence, but understanding how to align with people outside of cannabis and to just take this seriously. This is a great responsibility to get this done correctly um, because it's helping so many people in so many different ways and they're developing in so many different ways around the world, you know? Yeah. I think that intersectionality piece, you know, kind of pulling other people in and understanding what what their issues are and and kind of meeting them where they are, I think that's the kind of now more than ever type of thing because we have obviously exited the cannabis is sexy portion of this story. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? As far as investment and otherwise. Um, and it's time to get down to even more work, um, which uh, you, you old school guys, I'm, I'm sure, are kind of rolling your eyes a little bit because it's been hard work along, you know, the whole way. But, uh, yeah, I think we're saying the same thing here, aren't we? Yeah, we are. And, and ultimately, you know, we were only able to, to pick it up after so many people before us uh, set the table right. for, for, for such opportunities right. and hard work. But uh, no, it, this, this industry is, is going to move in, in, a, in a bunch of different directions. Um, but the, the thing is that it, it is here to stay. And as governments evaluate how to uh, treat this, this as an industry, and as we see um, e- even in, in recent days that the use of cannabis is being seriously and closely examined as a possible um, treatment towards coronavirus symptoms. For example, we heard uh, about a particular National uh, Institute of Health going out and looking at how cannabinoids could be used to prevent the inflammation of the lungs and what I believe is called fibrosis. That's one of the grave uh, you know, impacts of this thing is it, uh, it makes your lungs sort of, you know, stop being able to function in those particular parts of your body. And and they believe cannabis can prevent that or slow that down from occurring. And they threw together a crack team, quite literally, the U.S. government did, Mm. to evaluate this right now in real time. Now, it's an evolving story, so we don't know where it's going to go yet. But it's if if these two things are happening at the same time uh, and the the science supports it, um, that is what gets us over the hump. Because remember, to our point a minute ago, the industry has always uh, resisted working with outsiders because it's always been maligned. It's always been treated as, uh, even as a law firm. You know, you talked to a cannabis law firm five years ago, or another law firm five years ago, you're a pot firm. They wouldn't talk to you. It was taboo. But that whole notion has right. changed and changed dramatically. So you had to st- stop as an industry defending yourself from your position of contact and became a position where now let's go out and interact and work with these people and try to integrate uh, into you know mainstream business. And that's not something that every cannabis professional wants to hear. You know, and, and uh, to your point, it's... Uh you know, a mindset and behavior that's been trained the other way. So, you know, <laughs> even the best of us have, have a tough time uh, changing, uh, you know, when, uh, when we didn't, when we didn't get trained, you know, uh, to the, you know, to, to one side and now we've got to come back to the other side. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's tough, but this, this is that moment. It really is. Well, and as we... this is that moment for, for kind of everything. Don't you think, you know, aren't we here where, is, doesn't it feel like uh, you know this whole thing can bring about a whole brand new reality? You see the pictures coming out of China and over uh, Italy and over the U.S. of the, the air pollution, you know, just kind of disappearing overnight. The oil worth worth less than zero. I mean, <laughs> this is a new day. Well, I love the idea of this new chapter, and specifically looking at the new chapter of cannabis, and and you know. There are so many technologies out there. There are so many things that cannabis hasn't touched yet. I'm, I'm looking, you know, at your background, Seth. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, blockchain. You know, this is something people talk about, uh, maybe particularly in regards to hemp and when we look at supply chains. But I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about uh, about how, you know, how we can digitize the future of cannabis, how we can introduce some of these new technologies technologies like blockchain into the cannabis supply chain yeah so i'm no expert i have spoken to experts and it seems to me like uh this is you know an opportunity but uh i think for the cannabis industry to bob's point earlier of of, you know just trying to kind of put one foot in front of the other and and be a regular industry um you gotta use it like maybe uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is looking at, at blockchain and not look at uh, a, you know, a digital currency. Now, having said that, societally, we got, what is it, 17, 21 million people that are uh, unemployed in three, four weeks. So uh, I still see that there there might be a digital currency moment here, uh, um, you know, uh, in tandem with uh, coronavirus. But I think that uh, as far as Cannabis is concerned, 
you know, we got to look at everything. We got to be uh, as innovative as possible. Blockchain's part of that, but we got to talk to other experts that can tell you how. Absolutely. Yeah, this is the time to do it, though. It, it does seem like, uh, you know, this is uh, this is an opportunity. And that's something we've tried to really uh, hone in on here on the Hobe Minute, that find the silver lining, find uh, you know, mm. find how you can take advantage. Write your own Corona story, as, as uh, Donnie Emmy put it, um, you know, mm. so, <laughs> interested, uh, interested in just, you know, what what do you look at as the silver linings here? What are you what are you kind of excited about in this future? Sure. Well, there's that saying, never waste a downturn, right? Um, so I, I, I mentioned it. I mean, you know, look at what we're saving the planet, you know, by mistake. Um, we've got uh, the, we're talking about, you know, uh, talking with my uh, other drug policy friends about uh, decarceration. We're doing a whole uh, SSDP, the Sensible 2020 event, and decarceration is a, a huge topic um, at, at that, uh, within that group. And and it's happening. It, you know, this is not something that uh, that that people thought about. Um, but it's happening because if not, the governors get sued. Uh, Governor Cuomo here in New York, he can tell you about it because his father got sued. My sister wrote an article about it, and and his father lost that lawsuit. Bob, you might know about that. Uh, you know, you got to keep the you got to keep the um, uh, the inmate safe, so to speak. How about um, how about so, that Cuomo though? He's done a heck of a job. It seems like. Oh sure. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, when you act uh, and provide leadership uh, in a moment of duress, um, you know, people are going to take notice and people are going to appreciate. It. Um, now, having said that, uh, you know, uh, where were we as far as preparation? Easy for me to say, but I'm not the governor, nor. Uh, was I a governor's son? <laughs> um, but no, in in the moment, uh, you know, uh, there's there's been there's been great work done, and it's a terrible, horrible situation with a lot of death and a lot of sickness. Um, but it does seem like we may be flattening the curve. We'll see. We'll see if there's a you know second wave or whatever they're talking about. But. I mean, I do, just to answer the question, uh, uh, I think that everything uh, uh, needs to be looked at, uh, everything that we were doing, all, uh, any, you know, policy that was in place, any way of doing business, um, you know, any any science that we were looking at, and we got to look at it with a new lens. So I, I do, I do see what you're talking about as far as the silver lining. I think there's silver linings all over well, if uh, if I had my way, we would uh, we would make sure that we keep thinking about things in a positive light, despite everything that's going on around us, because that's really where the opportunity lies. But uh, you know, I've got an opportunity here. I to, just want to interrupt you. Yeah. Because, I just want to interrupt you, Bob, because Grateful Dead fans know that you just made a record. <laughs> you just said, "If I had." my way i just didn't want that to go on well no 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 listen the eyes of the world are upon us so we have to uh there we go so now the uh the uh at the moment unfortunately we're going to hell in a bucket but at least yeah exactly exactly right but uh no so so uh that that is interesting uh as we sort of tie up that that issue of cryptocurrency and, and potential uh, d- digital currency development, it does seem like there will be an opportunity there. But to your point, it just goes to the whole theme about the evolution of the industry. If you're going to behave uh, uh, like an industry, if you're going to act like you belong instead of stop defending yourself and projecting accordingly, uh, then things will progress. And uh, it doesn't have to be one way or the other, but that's what needs to take place in the rest of 2020. People just need to step up and do what they have to do. And guess what? We get led by the hemp farmers now because we get to see what they're doing in the next four to eight weeks. And that's going to be very telling. Now, when do we get a decorticator on every corner? That's my question to you, Bob. Believe it or not, they sell a decorticator that's the size of, you know, in, uh, one of those box air conditioners that you put on a, on a, on a stool and you can roll it around. Um, I don't know how good it is, but 
it isn't t- technically possible, but no, that, that's what we were talking about. This was the evolution of the industry shifting away from single purpose CBD crops more towards whole purpose or industrial style there crops that service multiple verticals versus just one. And understanding that once we've sorted that out and farmers can do things reliably and consistently, then the infrastructure needs to step up. And, and that is what's going to give the farmers certainty and which will create the uh, the, the demand, which is supported by need and science on the corporate and the purchaser side, it just hasn't been scaled up reliably yet. That's it. But that this is that moment, is it not? I mean, we can make anything that you can think of with him. I don't have to tell you that. This is when to build that infrastructure. Uh, you know, ne- never, never miss the opportunity in the downturn. I think that that might be the biggest one. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we'll keep our ears to the ground on that one because uh, with this being the biggest year for hemp growth in the United States, the most acreage ever being devoted to hemp, at least in contemporary history. You're the anthropologist here, so I don't want to make sure I'm saying anything incorrect. Um, You know, it'll be very interesting to see where all of that raw material goes after harvest. I will say one thing, Seth, because you made a great point earlier. It's a lot easier to maintain positivity and stay in good spirits when you are in the proximity of that Bob Hope and smile, which uh, we are, we are lucky enough to be. So that's a, you know, that's important note. (laughs) It, it, Seth, it reminds me of that Seinfeld episode with the Wiz. Do you know that one where, well, the the Wiz had this smile, and when he smiled, his teeth glistened. Uh, and and anyway, uh, go back and watch it. <laughs> there you have it. Oh, Seth, well, we thank you so much for taking your time to come and be with us on the Hoban Minute, uh, sharing all of your insights, and we can't wait to have you again. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Stay safe, guys, and uh... – Listen, wash your hands. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hoban Minutes special series on coronavirus and cannabis. You can head on over to hoban.law for more information on this podcast or the Hoban Law Group. If you have any ideas for subjects that we should be covering or any questions you want to pose to, to Bob or myself, shoot us an email at media at hoban.law. And stay tuned for the next episode on this special series, Coronavirus and Cannabis. <laughs>